We've got now Dr. Brian Callahan in the stream with us, our resident OpenBSD expert now. Before we start the talk, Brian, why don't you please go ahead and introduce yourself and the talk uh, for the benefit of future viewers who might not see the talk before they see the Q&A. So. Sure. Yeah. So like Mike said, I'm Brian Callahan. I'm a longtime OpenBSD developer and a professor in the Information Technology and Web Science program at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in good old upstate New York. And this talk is kind of chronicling my adventures in porting all three decompilers to OpenBSD and also kind of thinking about how we can take the lessons that I've learned and bring them to other platforms that don't yet have decompilers to help proliferate um, the availability of the language on different platforms. So my first question for you has to be, what brought you to OpenBSD? All the way back in 2005, when I was in college, I had an old laptop that I had brought with me to my undergrad at Carnegie Mellon. And at the time, I don't know if they still do, but at the time, they let you just run servers on the open public internet from your dorm room with public IP addresses, because CMU has so many IP addresses to give out. So I figured to myself, all right, I'm going to learn how to run a mail server. So I set up that laptop and tried to get some software on it to run a mail server. And I had known about Linux and, you know, I tried to get Linux installed on the thing and either some of the hardware worked or other some of the hardware worked, but never all of the hardware worked. So I'm sure I Googled for something along the lines of like open source operating system, not Linux and FreeBSD popped up. So I said, sure, why not? Let's give this a try. I installed it and all of the hardware worked when running FreeBSD. So I figured, all right, well, I might as well just hang out here for a while. And then about 2010 or so, you may all remember that claim to be like fully open source laptop, those little MIPS laptops that had come out, the ones that I think RMS was using. And I figured to myself, that looks neat. I'll buy one of those, see what happens. And the Linux operating system that it came with was abysmal. The kernel would crash every five minutes or so. And FreeBSD didn't have a port of it, but OpenBSD had a port to that hardware. And so I figured, all right, let's just go ahead and try this. I'll put OpenBSD on this machine. It'll be kind of familiar because I already know FreeBSD. And sure enough, it worked and it worked fine. And then I guess as things are want to happen, you find uh, things that, that bug you with the system. And then you start fixing the things that bug you with the system. And then if you do that long enough, they punish you with, um, with an account. So then you can commit the fixes yourself. Yeah, so I have just always been really fascinated with programming languages. You know, I think it's a really neat thing to see all the different ways that people have come up to solve both similar and different problems, right? We can almost all code, right, similar applications and libraries with all different kinds of languages, but we do it in very different ways. And I've always been interested in how we come up with these different ways to solve these problems. And so that kind of put me on a crusade of, well, if I'm going to, to learn something about all these different ways that we have to solve these problems, well, I better get all these compilers and interpreters running on my system. And my system happens to be OpenBSD. So let's get to it. Let's start porting all these different language compilers and stuff to OpenBSD. And then I'll learn something about the languages along the way. So it's kind of a win-win for me. OpenBSD gets stuff and I get to learn about all these different languages. In the talk, you uh, mentioned that when you first uh, came into the D forums, you made a post and Walter responded. And that's where you found out about the D Language Foundation and the big four that were supported. And this was in 2017. And you made an effort to port LDC to OpenBSD that uh, was unsuccessful. But what I didn't get from the talk was what brought you to D in the first place? I do not remember what was the impetus so something happened in 2017 that put D on my radar. Don't remember off the top of my head what that thing was. I'm sure it was probably a talk or maybe the conference that just happened or right something got posted on Hacker News or, or Reddit or something like that. Um, and I had never heard of the language before. And so, yeah, I wish I, I had a better story for exactly how I found out about D, but it was just kind of 
something that that came across my computer monitor at at, at some point. I really don't remember what the actual impetus of it was. Could have also been the FreeBSD efforts to put LDC in their port system. So surprisingly, as far as I can tell, FreeBSD does not have a package available in their packet system for DMD, but they have one for LDC. And that might've also kind of tipped me off because I do always track what all the other BSDs are working on in terms of ports and packages. So I can find the next interesting things to port and package myself for OpenBSD. How many languages compilers have you moved over to OpenBSD now? So I gave another talk, kind of the flip of this talk. Instead of introducing OpenBSD to the D people, I gave a talk introducing D and some other languages to the BSD people. And so I had to do a quick accounting for that. I think at this point, I'm just about or slightly over the, the 50 compilers and interpreters wow. mark. <laughs> now it's not all now it's not all 50 different languages right you know so there's like 2c compilers in there there's 3d compilers so right the number of languages is less but the number of compilers and interpreters is hovering around that that 50 number at the moment like i said i enjoy doing this i don't i can't really explain to you why i enjoy doing this but i have a lot of fun exploring like i said how other people think about how to go about solving problems and so i'm always interested in seeing what the next language is going to be. Among all of these compilers and interpreters that you've brought to BSD, OpenBSD, how does D rank in, in terms of the difficulty you had getting there? Is it is it near the top of the list in terms of difficulty, near the bottom, somewhere in the middle? Yeah. So unfortunately, some are really straightforward. Some are, you know, there's an interpreter or compiler. It's written in C in really standard Unix C. So you type make you get the compiler out and it just works. So there's some like um, the Algol 68G compiler is like that, right? It's just a bunch of C files that just happen to understand Algol 68. You compile it on any platform and it kind of just works. And then there are like the incredibly different, different, different and difficult languages, I should say. You know, difficult languages, things like um, Modula 2, which... I help port the GNU Modular 2 compiler, which is on the way to being added to GCC, just like D was um, not all that long ago. And right, that you had to actually dig into some GCC internals to actually get the thing working. And then there were some also just confusions on kind of its implementation languages, which was C++ 11. I think it's still C++ 11 for, for M2. And there was some confusion about how the standard actually interprets certain things like nulls. Believe it or not, the C++ standard gives you like five different possibilities for what your NULL can end up being defined to be. And M2 compiler like actually required one of the five different possible interpretations of what null could be, right? So that's like super difficult, right? Dealing with not just implementation, but also other language implementations to figure out what the compiler is trying to do. D worked out pretty well once I figured out the correct path to actually get all the different compilers working. So way back in 2017, when I first learned about D, I did not know about GDC. I'd only known about, I guess, LDC and DMD. And DMD was already at that time, I think, Bootstrap, right? I think it was already written in D by 2017. And so LDC was the only thing that I knew of that might have given me a chance. And they had a branch called LTS Master, which was an old, old, old version of the compiler, but they kept it just up to date enough so that you can compile more modern versions of LDC. So I figured I'd give that a try. And I had gotten to the point where it was able to compile like simple hello world binaries and working hello world binaries, but it didn't have enough in D runtime to actually support a more full system. So I kind of gave up on it. And then restarting, you know, back earlier this year, I learned about GDC and realized that, oh, GDC is just hooking into GCC. And I already have GCC on my system and I already know how to compile GCC on my system. And this one's still using the C++ front end for D. So maybe that's the right solution. It turns out that is the, the right solution. Because um, GDC, as long as you have enough support in D runtime, which by that point, 
some other people had come along, Kai, Ian, a couple of others had come along and pretty much filled out all the necessary missing pieces for OpenBSD support, at least enough to have the compilers self-hosting um, that I was able to kind of just swoop in and put those pieces together and realize that, oh, this in fact will work and I can use it to bootstrap both itself and um, the other compilers, DMD and LDC. So we've got a question from the live stream here um, from Ricky Cattermall. How do you find other language implementations, test suites compared to D for catching issues with their builds? So I guess that really depends on the language. So D is really good in that sense. And actually I still have a couple of bugs on my list that I discovered from the DMD suite, um, I guess a week or two ago. Yeah, D is, is pretty well up there, at least for what I've been looking at, which is really just at this point to fill out all the missing pieces. I'm sure there are still some missing pieces compared to, let's say, Windows or something like that. Um, so for me, it's been great. Uh, not every language is so great, but um, Ds happens to be you know, a good test suite for kind of fleshing out all the bugs that I'm in the process of working on. As I get those bugs fixed and figured out, I'm sure I'll find other bugs, and then I'll have to reevaluate where the test suite is for those new bugs once I find them. But that's a future me problem. When you're implementing, when you're importing these compilers and uh, interpreters, you don't always know the language uh, that you're porting beforehand, so you have to pick it up as you go. How's, how is that process for you? Are, are you quick at it? I mean, some people pick languages up like a sponge. I just, okay, I guess that means no. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, I don't, I don't, you know, no one's ever asked me that question if I'm, if I'm faceted or not. So I've never really had to think about it. Uh, but one of the things I will say, just being a porter at large, right, for more than just compilers and interpreters is unlike a language or even an operating system, right? So OpenBSD, most of our stuff is written in C. There's a little bit of stuff in Perl, a little bit of stuff maybe in shell and assembly. So if you know those four languages, you can pretty much move around the entire OpenBSD operating system and know what you're doing. Right? Even if you just knew C, you'd be able to do you know, 95% of it. When it comes to ports and packages, you don't get a choice about the languages those software programs are written in. You just have to accept them as they are. And so you kind of have to just learn a bunch of different languages, at least kind of the, the basics of all the different languages. Right? You'll have to learn Python because there's plenty of Python software out there that needs to be ported, right? You'll have to learn C++. There's tons of C++ software out there. You'll have to learn things like Rust because, right, there's more and more Rust stuff showing up both in the ecosystem and in OpenBSD packages. So you kind of have to learn all these things. Um, I will say D was not anywhere near the top of the difficult languages for me to learn, right? I essentially just kind of pretended that D was C for a while and that was enough to get me going and figure out what I need to do. And then, all right, so D is more than C, obviously. It's also C and C++. And, you know, well, we all have to learn object-oriented programming in school and, and whatnot. So, right, so all those fundamentals were, were still there. You know, I still get tripped up occasionally because the D compilers really, really dislike when you use, um, like, C-style um, pointers and array syntax, and they error out on you and complain that you must write this in D style. So remembering to just you know move the arrays and the stars over to you know the the type definition rather than putting the arrays at the end of the the variable. I still I still get that one wrong more than I I care to admit. Um, but actually understanding what D code is doing, you know, at this point, you know, I'm, I'm pretty pretty well set in in what what's going on. You've some very different languages, right? Uh, syntax wise. And uh, so my next question is, how bad does that trip you up? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't gotten to the point where I've started writing like APL or something, thinking that it was D or C or something like that. So at least on that front, I'm able to keep, you know, the basics of the different kind of paradigms of languages separate from one another. Um, but Yes, I have even caught myself, right, you know, being a professor, I have to, at some point, explain code to students, and I end up writing a bunch of code, right, to, as a sample code to give to students, and I have definitely caught myself writing one language, and then taking a look at it and saying to myself, this is not what I'm teaching in class tomorrow, this is a whole different language, let me now go back and, and rewrite this thing in the language that I intend to, which is usually... The language I intend to is usually JavaScript, and then it usually 
I end up writing some other language instead of, of JavaScript. So yes, <laughs> I wish I had a better uh, kind of finger memory in that sense to be able to say, okay, at this moment, I'm writing this language and fingers just, you know, take the wheel and write that language and don't, don't mess me up and write some other language instead. But I'll get there, I think, maybe. We have a question here in the live stream. Were any of OpenBSD's security features a problem when porting? He s says something here about, uh, I don't know what the WX is, but syscalls only from LiveC, et cetera. Yeah, so he's talking about like WX or X. OpenBSD's security features were not an issue at all for any of the, the decompilers. The question is kind of which ones of our built-in security features do you get with the different compilers? Interestingly enough, you do get some of those security features with some of the compilers and not with others. Um, and some I've had to write in myself, right? So kind of the very first thing I did when I got DMD up and running and GDC up and running is I added the ability to call things like pledge and unveil, which are two of our most popular security features, right? So what pledge does, for those who don't know, um, Pledge lets you put in essentially a list of broad categories that the program will do over its lifetime. And the kernel will disable any syscall that isn't included in that list of things that you say that this program will do. So you can be super restrictive and literally take away every single syscall except for the exit syscall. Or you can add stuff back, right? So you can do things like standard I.O., reading files, writing files, connecting to sockets, connecting to the network, things like that. And unveil is kind of the opposite of pledge where you kind of take away all the file system reading and only add back what it is that you want from the file system, right? So we have one for syscalls and one for the file system itself. So that was really easy. That was really simple. That was just me writing, what was it? Three or four lines of code, you know, X turn C and then the declarations for both pledge and unveil. And that was, that was really simple and got into um, D really quickly. As for some of our other mitigations, so you get things like WX or X kind of basically for free, unless you for some reason turned it off on your system. You get RetGuard. So RetGuard is kind of like our return instruction pointer verifier. It basically ensures that on a return from a function that the instruction pointer hasn't been um, changed. So it's kind of a more advanced stack cookies you might think about it because it actually does instrument the return pointer itself. For parts of, of D, with some of the compilers, you actually get some of RetGuard. Um, so it turns out, at least on OpenBSD, DMD ends up being linked by the C compiler. If you actually kind of have the verbose things um, turned on so you can actually see what it's doing, you will see an invocation of the C compiler at one point, which I believe is on the linking stage. And so at least for parts, of uh, maybe the support libraries that come from OpenBSD, those will still be protected with RetGuard and stuff like that. I actually have been trying to, that's kind of my shadow thing that I was gonna talk about in this live stream. I'm actually kind of trying to figure out how to get RetGuard set up on DMD kind of more broadly. So kind of all the different D functions can take advantage of that. I would have to double check. I'm pretty sure that you wouldn't get RetGuard for GDC because you don't normally get it from, from GCC. And I would have to double check LDC. I don't remember off the top of my head. And then as for syscalls being through libc, I haven't had any problem with that whatsoever, which kind of leads me to believe that there are no bare syscalls being made in any of the three compilers, which would kind of make sense to me. You were surprised to find out that TLS just works and you didn't expect that it did. So on um, LDC and, well, I guess LLVM and GCC, they both use the emulated TLS, the thread local storage emulated version that both GCC and LLVM carry. So all of our compilers still use those things. They still will use emulated thread local storage instead of the real thing. The exception though, is that DMD doesn't know how to do that. DMD will simply create TLS sections in your ELF executables and just begin to put like your G shared variables into there. I have been very surprised, both myself and another OpenBSD developer, um, G Kohler, who actually did the work porting PowerPC64 support to GDC. We have found that these sections just kind of work on OpenBSD, at least kind of in maybe the most simplistic of cases. You know, I haven't really kind of stress test 
to see exactly what the limits of OpenBSD's actual TLS section support is, but at least for all the basic stuff, right? All of the compilers, particularly DMD, anything that might be in D runtime or Phobos or kind of any of the D code that I've just been compiling and working with, with dub and stuff like that, all seem to work just fine. And that was a surprise. It, it shouldn't be. I don't be. think anyone's really tried it. It, it shouldn't be because the uh, 32-bit OS2 TLS support was all emulated. Mm -hmm. And the thing about the sections is those sections are a standard feature of the object file format. And there's there's no reason that they, they shouldn't work on other platforms. How the emulation worked in the 32-bit OS was instead of having the linker patch things up, the compiler would emit some code to add the base address to get at the specific TLS mm -hmm. data. So that code is still in the library and all that. It, it's just been kind of bypassed and hasn't been used for a while. But uh, putting stuff in the sections should, there's no reason why it shouldn't work. I mean, that's the whole point of sections. So you can group things together and do things with it. Right. Yeah, it was just a little bit of a surprise because right, none of us had ever seen binaries with those sections there, and then they just worked. And both he and I were were pleasantly surprised that that it worked. Well, the thing is, I had to use sections that nobody else was using, <laughs> <laughs> or, or would have failed because <laughs> it, it would have confused the two. So yeah, that's really uh, a, a big deal with uh, the object file format and the linker is you create sections to group uh, things together that need to belong together. Mm -hmm. and, and then you need to create two additional sections, one that goes at the beginning of it and one that goes at the end. So you can find the start address and the end address of the section. And that's all features of the object file and the linker, not of the runtime library. So as long as they're using L format or, you know, macho and OS X, at least that part of it is going to work. Like I said, the thing that's missing is the linker and the special fix-ups for it. Well, the emulator just has some code the compiler inserts and in that uh, goes and uh, gets the base address for the section. And and then getting the offset from the start of a section is a standard uh, object file relocation fix-up. So yeah, it should work fine. I think uh, you're the first person I've heard refer to the Mac OS file format as macho. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was, I've I was, never, I, I ran into that the other day and I thought, huh, that sounds fine. So I'll just, <laughs> I just start calling it the macho format. <laughs> uh, let's see. We had another question in the live stream chat. Uh, now, which of the compilers would you recommend for learning D on OpenBSD? Well, so I guess at the moment it would be LDC, but LDC is not yet in the package repository. It's ready to go. I just have to get an okay to actually import it. You know, GDC, right, is still, as we know, lagging behind in terms of the front end. Um, I do know that Ian, because I do track the GCC mailing list. So I know Ian is ready to go to update the front end for GDC to be in line with the other compilers. The downside here is that we only update GCC on OpenBSD once in like a blue moon because we use Clang for our base compiler. And actually Clang is the thing that we use for um, our compiler basically for everything. And so GCC is kind of like a, for the few things that we actually need GCC for like a Fortran compiler, things like that. You know, we keep a version around, you know, we jump from version 8.4 to 11.2. So at that rate, we'll jump from 11.2 to 14 or 15 point something at, at this rate. So, um, it's very likely that we'll kind of be carrying that older version of GDC for a while. And so your best bet probably is, I guess it'd be LDC because I'm going to work on bringing in line more languages for LDC, right? Which is just, just kind of not possible for DMD with DMD only actually supporting x86 and x86-64 for their backends. So that's kind of what I have on, on my docket is increasing the language, uh, sorry, increasing the CPU support for LDC. And then that would kind of be my go-to compiler for both learning and using D on OpenPSD. Um, Ali has a question. How does D fare among all the languages you know? In terms of what? Platforms, probably. AMD 64, what else? Okay, so as of today, 
right? DMD officially in the package only has x86-64 support. I have a package ready to go for 32-bit x86 for DMD. I just need to get an okay to commit it. For GDC, we are currently shipping packages, I believe, for x86-32, x86-64, ARM32, ARM64, PowerPC32, PowerPC64. Theoretically, if Spark support is there from GDC, I haven't actually spoken to Ian about this, but if Spark64 is there, that support, then we can turn on Spark64 packages for GDC. And I believe I saw Ian talking about on the GCC mailing list actually having tested GDC with PA risk, which we also support on OpenBSD. Um, and so in theory, if that support is there, we could even turn on GDC for PA risk. Can't imagine anyone would actually use it, but we can try. We can see what happens. In terms of LDC, at the moment, it's just x86-64 and x86-32. But I know the, the ARM support is there because the Android people use LDC. So getting 32-bit and 64-bit ARM support will kind of be most immediate on my to-do list once I import LDC. And then I'll take it from there, right? So almost all of OpenBSD's CPU platforms support LLVM. The only ones that don't are Alpha and PA Risk and Motorola 88K. And that's just because neither of those three actually have LLVM backends. So presuming that the support is there in D runtime, you'll see packages for all of those things in OpenBSD eventually. Yeah, Ali says he basically just wanted to hear good things about D. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, if someone wants to take the, the time and effort to actually get a Motorola 88K backend for GDC or something, um, it turns out OpenBSD is the last operating system that supports Motorola 88K to the present day. But I think they're still stuck on GCC3 to make that happen. But if anyone can think about how to make that, that work, we'll, we'll probably have users who will use it. Ricky Catamol, Catamol, uh, he says, am I understanding this right? Will TLS on ELF basically just work with P threads automatically working regardless of D runtime status? Uh, the emulation of the TLS won't work without the startup code calling the initialize routines, okay? So if you just create a thread with P thread and expect TLS to work, it won't because the D runtime doesn't know about the thread, okay? So you'd have to start up the thread with P thread and then have the uh, TLS code initializer uh, run in the D runtime library in order for it to work. Ate Escola, he's asking, is there any portable equivalent available for Pledge? Wish it was on other OSs too, wow. defensive coding, if any. Well, no is the quick answer, but the longer answer is what people generally do is they'll have, like in C code, they'll put a define that says um, pledge equals zero because pledge returns zero on success and negative one on failure. So people will still write code including pledge, but it'll only ever actually work on, on OpenBSD. And that's proven to be by far one of our most popular security mechanisms. And, you know, we all love it on the OpenBSD side. I mean, it's gotten to the point where, you know, we almost don't think to code without it at this point, right? Because it's so easy. Right, and just gives you basically free security and just letting the kernel figure out which syscalls you actually have available and which ones you don't. I'm hopeful that other systems will eventually adopt it. I know the Serenity team has adopted some OpenBSD security mechanisms. I do not know if Pledge is one of them. Um, I think they may have adopted Unveil. So maybe I'm hopeful for the future that others will adopt these things. There are equivalents like FreeBSD as Capsicum which does similar work. There's also things like um, SE Linux, which can also do similar work. I don't know if there's anything similar on Mac OS or on Windows. Ethan has a comment here about, it's not a question, it's a comment about uh, version POSIX. He says uh, plus one for version POSIX, by the way, that covers things like Android and iOS, which really should be first class OSs by now. And I noticed earlier, I uh, didn't get a chance to mention it. Steve also mentioned uh, version POSIX for Mac OS. And yeah, I, I 
use this in my bindings, actually, my loaders, because uh, especially for like, uh, sometimes Mac OS does things differently. So you, you've always got to be careful that if, if you're going to make a distinction between this, a specific platform like Mac OS or Linux and POSIX, to make sure to put the, platform, the specific platform first and put POSIX at the bottom as a catch-all. Yeah, and that's my next like D Lang mission for you know user space code. Walter's already seen it. I've already sent I sent him a pull request doing exactly that for the the med editor. The biggest offender I found at the moment for version Linux was the ASRD library. Um, there's a all of it is version Linux, and almost none of it is actually Linux specific. Um, at least not the stuff that I have looked at. So that's kind of my next big project eventually. I know I have all these big projects and exactly zero time to fulfill all those projects. But hey, as long as it's on the to-do list, I can say that I started it, right? And that's what counts. Uh, Luis asks, shouldn't GDC be packaged as normal GCC? On Arch, we have sub packages for GCC front ends. For example, G4Tran is on GCC Fortran. Are front ends completely separate in OpenBSD? Yeah, so what you would do on OpenBSD is you just say package at GDC and you would get just GDC and its support libraries. You could also do package at G++ to get C++. For historical reasons, the Fortran compiler is still called G95, even though we're not actually using G95 anymore. Um, and that would get you just the Fortran compiler. And if you just did package add GCC, you would just get the C compiler. So all the front ends are, are we just don't prefix them with, with GCC, we just use their actual names. And the same thing with the ADA compiler as well. Um, that we pack as add GNAT, GNAT. Uh, Webfreak asks, do you also code on OpenBSD or just deploy on it? And what editor oh. do you use? Oh, so I only have OpenBSD machines, I guess with the exception of my phone, but I will figure out how to get OpenBSD on that as well. <laughs> so, I mean, I everything on, on OpenBSD. Um, as for what editor do I use? Vim, because I'm old and I don't want to change editors. And I learned VI, I don't know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and I'm, I don't want to change. Okay, Ricky has a speculation here. How much work would it be for better C with a separate thread library in terms of TLS? Because you don't have D runtime. Right. Well, you can always just uh, write in the support code yourself if you need it. <laughs> and, you know, just excise, just, you know, snip it out of D runtime and use it. But if the, the C runtime library supports uh, TLS, then better C should support it too, because it uses the same mechanism. The uh, TLS support in uh, D runtime is mainly to initialize the D runtime library. The C runtime library, well, that's, that's taken care of by the uh, existing C runtime library. So, you know what, I'd expect that better C, it should just work. If the C runtime library is supports thread local storage, um, better C it should just work. There's no reason for D to have a different TLS strategy than C's one. And the only reason I wrote that emulator for OSX was there was no support from C for it. We have a question from Ezna here. Uh, should we expect OpenBSD to become the fifth officially supported platform? Yeah, Walter, should we expect OpenBSD <laughs> to become the fifth officially supported platform? Well, how many users are there for it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm all for it as if the users are there. I don't know what the magic number is. Um, and maybe it's one of those uh, build it and they will come things. <laughs> but I don't see any reason not to do it if there's uh, customers there. And yeah, we can fact, even be simply different as well, right? We don't necessarily need like the official download binaries, right? Because we can always just say they're in the repository, right? So there may even be some shortcuts we can take on the OpenBSD side to help make that transition even easier. Well, I'm certainly not averse to any uh, OpenBSD pull requests. I have no problem merging those in. We have a number of those for different operating systems that aren't officially supported. So uh, yeah. Yeah, no, and thank you for that. I have I've sent plenty of pull requests your way for DMD and D runtime and Phobos. And so yes, I appreciate the the willingness and welcomingness of of other operating systems to D. 
um, getting it uh, officially supported means uh, getting a test suite machine and running the test suite regular on it. That's that's probably the largest uh, amount of work to get it to get it uh, mainstream. All right, so there's the call. Who wants to help me? Everyone in the Open BSD world knows where I am and how to get a hold of me. So if that's the project you want to do, Open BSD people. Shoot me an email. There's also NetBSD, so you're up for that too. <laughs> am I, I? I am not part of NetBSD. I have lots of friends who are, op- are NetBSD developers. I have friends right throughout the entire BSD community, but I can think of some people in NetBSD who might be up to the the challenge. Well, FreeBSD doesn't have many users. That was pushed through mainly because I like FreeBSD. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I thought having another POSIX implementation would be, uh, you know, very good for the stability and portability of decode. Uh, Walter, um, Ali says he doesn't agree with your uh, number of users qualification. Uh, with that logic, we should all move to C++. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> All right, I got a question from the live stream from Ali. Uh, pledge and unveil seem to give the reins to the program as opposed to capability-based OSs. Was the latter a failed idea? I don't know if it was a failed idea. I think it was just a different way of thinking about the problem. You know, I think. Like everything else, if someone came along with a solid implementation and was willing to fight for it, then there would probably be a conversation among the developers to see if that would be included. Okay, then that's it. So, uh, Brian, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, close us out here? Sure. What's your final uh, thoughts? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you to all the D community first for having me here and talking and also for taking all of my OpenBSD code into your repositories. Um, yeah, everybody knows where to find me in the OpenBSD world. It's just bcala at openbsd.org. Feel free to shoot me emails, chat with me. I'm always happy to chat with people about really anything. So uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation. And I think we can all thank you for bringing D to OpenBSD for us. Yes, my thank pleasure. you very much, Brian. Yeah, my pleasure, don't worry. That, that, that I'm happy to do. Yeah, much appreciated. All right, and now I'm, whoops. Tab with the wrong browser here. Hang on. All right, now I'm going to pick a winner.